Happy 4th of July, my American brethren, and to my foreign listeners, you're welcome. Look, I've decided to be lazy today by re-uploading my previous 4th of July stories from six years ago. Yes, it's been six years since I've done 4th of July stories. I'm going to spend the day trying not to scare my kids with the little fireworks we got them. My kiddos are very docile. I hope you all have a super fun Independence Day and a safe one at that. Eat well, don't get blown up, and don't say Skinwalker too many times. I hear they like hot dogs. Some quick updates before I go. Dozens of folks have signed up to listen to Lore and our other bonus goodies as EerieCast Plus members. Thank you. I've completely revamped the EerieCast store. Go to EerieCast.store to check it out. We have mugs, tumblers, shirts, stickers, hoodies, and soon cryptid cards. Problem at the moment is YouTube won't let me show our new merch store items on my YouTube channel. And they won't tell me how to fix it, so... whatever. Finally, the Freaky Folklore Compendium pre-order bonuses are ready to ship. They'll be heading out to those lucky few on July 16th. I posted a reverse unboxing on my Twitter if you want to check out what you'll be getting. Just look me up at Dark Prevails. Now, let's begin. One, easily the scariest moment of my life, by Hayden. It was a hot summer day in the middle of July. My father, my little sister, and I were going up to visit my grandfather for a sort of late Independence Day get-together. He lived about eight hours away in a little town in the middle of farmland. After a long drive, we finally turned down that all-too-familiar gravel road. I watched from the windows, and his neighbors watched us pass. Now, to explain where he lives, there is a long gravel road that leads to his home. On both sides of the road, there are houses, but as you go down further, you can either turn left to go to my uncle's motorhome, or keep going straight, and you'll see a huge red barn. Behind the barn, there are three huge fields that my grandfather owns, and behind all of that, there is a creek that runs through the neighboring properties. Now, because he is surrounded by only livestock and family, he never locked up anything. But that night, I wish he had. It was around 3 a.m. on the second day we were visiting. I was up and awake in one of the bedrooms. My sister was asleep in another room next to mine, and my dad was sleeping on a covered patio. I decided I should get some sleep, but I didn't want to be alone, at least not for the moment. I felt a feeling of sudden dread in my stomach. I went to the patio where my father was sleeping and opened the sliding glass door to enter the cold room. Now this room was covered in windows as I lied down on the couch for about an hour. My eyes soon began to fall droopily. For some reason, I felt a sudden urge to look around. I looked forward through the sliding glass door and looked into the living room. In a far window, I saw a silhouette of a figure. I sat there petrified. Now you're probably confused on how this home is laid out. The patio was once opened, but he closed it. If you walked to the right, you could go into a small breakfast room and go through a door that leads to the kitchen and a main room. To the left is the backyard. If you were where I was, if you go straight, you'll walk through the sliding glass doors that also lead to the main room. If you turn right, there are two bedrooms and a bathroom. As I looked through the living room, I saw the figure walk up onto the front porch and start trying to wiggle the doorknob, and then I saw it slowly open. It wasn't locked, and I nearly wet myself. I had one way that I could access my grandpa's room. I walked over to the far side of the room and creeped through the door, the one that was connected to the kitchen. When I finally reached the door that led to the kitchen, I slowly opened it and ducked behind the counter. I crawled steadily to his bedroom door. I tried to do this all while not being seen or heard. I heard the stranger go into the room where I once was. He was scavenging through my grandma's old stuff, and at this point, I could see the living room, the porch, and my grandpa's room. I watched the man make his way to the closet. 
I took my chance and I bolted to my grandpa's room. I woke him up and I began to cry, trying to explain to him what was happening. He finally understood and he quietly jumped up and unlocked his safe. He grabbed one of the many arms inside of his safe. Then he rushed into the kitchen. I remember shaking so bad, waiting for something to happen. I had told my grandpa that my sister was still in her room sleeping. He had cursed under his breath. He sat me behind the counter and told me to wait. He made his way over and walked into the room the guy was in. I heard the clicking sound of my grandfather loading the weapon. And just then, I heard a yell of pain, but the voice was familiar. It was from my grandfather. I was crying now, as apparently the man tackled my grandpa to the floor. Then I ran to go get my dad. My father told me to call the cops, and I ran to my cell phone and called them. I remember the operator. She had such a sweet and calm voice. It really gave me a sense of safety. My grandfather managed to pin the man to the ground. He and my father kept him pinned down until the cops arrived. I still remember shaking outside with my little sister, waiting for the police to show. I remember the look the man gave me as he was escorted into the back of a cop car. It wasn't until last month that I got the whole story of what happened that night. The man was someone from my grandfather's work. My granddad explained that he had asked him to complete a task which my grandfather was incapable of doing. So what set the guy off? Well, my grandfather never thanked him for doing it, and that was all that needed to be done. He came over, ready to take my grandfather's stuff and even attack him, all because of a lack of thanks. You truly don't know who people are until you make them angry. I haven't gone back to this day. It has really scared me to be in that house. I don't want to imagine what would have happened if I hadn't seen him because I was sleeping. Two, The Party Crasher by Jaden T. This happened to me and a group of friends of mine back in the summer of 2015. My best friend Sean, his twin sister Cassidy, and I were celebrating our recent graduation on the 4th of July. We were having a large backyard barbecue. The majority of the graduating class showed up, and everything was going well. My parents were even cool with the party, as long as there was no alcohol, and that there was an adult on hand by the door to make sure nothing was snuck in or out. I ran this past my friends, and unlike what you see on TV, everyone was fine with that. Back to the party. It was just a bunch of good friends, good times, and fireworks. There were 60 of us in the large field behind the property, enjoying cheap soda and hot dogs. Some folks were even playing football. The ones hanging around in the yard or the house were treated to a random YouTube playlist being blared through the speakers. There was rock and hip hop with a few cringeworthy selections thrown in for laughs, and it made for a great time. The next thing I knew, Sean came outside with a grin on his face. Dude, he said, you've gotta see this. He began to pull me into the living room. I get in there to find a man roughly in his early 40s dancing to the music on the coffee table. He was thrusting his hips and doing the worst Magic Mike impersonation I've ever seen. I laughed at first, but something about this man made me uneasy. I couldn't help but wonder whose parent this was. My dad was hauling freight somewhere in Utah, and my mom covered a shift at the local ER. I texted her and asked her to call me when she had a free moment, but I knew it could be a while before she called. I decided to act on my instinct and follow the man around. Within minutes of my recon work, I saw something that sent up several red flags. I have an above ground pool in my yard, as well as two bathrooms in my house. One of the bathrooms was being used as a girl's changing room, my mom's master bath, and had a large dresser with an even larger mirror facing the bathroom door. 
At one point, I followed him. He hid in such a way in my parents' room that he could see the open door to the bathroom where the girls were changing. There was a large mirror there, and he could get a look at everything that was happening, and he began to fondle himself. What in the heck do you think you're doing? I asked. He stumbled over his words like a kid being caught peeking at his birthday presents. He answered, I, I, I thought I saw one of the girls walk in there with a bottle of Jose Cuervo. I quickly retorted, You are meant to be checking people at the door, not in the bathroom. I'll send someone in to check, but you need to leave this room. I went outside and found my friend Tracy sitting in a lawn chair on the pool deck. I asked her to go inside and check on the girls in the changing room. I informed her of our chaperone's actions. She got all red in the face and said she'd stand guard until the master bathroom was empty. About half an hour went by and Tracy found me. Nope, there's no liquor anywhere near those girls, and they're as sober as sober can be, she said. I was mad, and I was ready to go find this guy when I hear my mom's ringtone. Hey honey, what's up? She asked me with a tone to her voice that said she was having a long day. Yeah, mom, who did you get to chaperone our party? Whoever this is has been sending up some majorly pervy flags. My mother paused for a moment before responding. It's your Uncle Terry. He should have been there hours ago. Is he not there? I went on to explain what I'd caught the guy doing, and my mom told me to get him out of the house. She was calling my uncle to find out what was going on with him. So Mr. Pervert was nothing more than a stranger off the street who loved to spy on girls. This was as infuriating as it was creepy. As I went to find him, after a minute or so, I heard a familiar shriek coming from our walk-in kitchen pantry. It was Cassidy. The last time I heard her scream like that, it was because the neighbor's dog was chewing on her. I knew this was bad. I ran to the kitchen as fast as I could and grabbed a big cleaver from the knife drawer. I ran over to the pantry door and tried to open it, but it was shut from the inside, like something had been jammed into the mechanism or leaning against the other side. I could hear Cassidy crying, and then I hear the man's voice inside with her. I just wanted seven minutes in heaven. I'm gonna get it, no matter what you say. That's all I had to hear. I went ballistic, and I began chopping at the door with the cleaver. A few swings in and the door fell open. Cassidy was on the ground trying to cover herself. Her clothes appeared to be torn. The man I'd been looking for was the one cornering her in the closet, attempting to have his way with her. He pushed past me and made a beeline for the front door, but I chased him down and I ended up tackling him in the driveway. At that point, I had no control over my fists as I began to rain down punches on him while screaming like a madman. It was like an out-of-body experience. I could see myself beating him into a pulp. This man who tried to irreparably hurt my best friend. I couldn't stop myself. Luckily for me, Sean and a few others heard the commotion. They ended up pulling me off of him. Cassidy came to the door looking for me and her brother saw the running mascara and her torn shirt. Soon the crowd had to hold both of us back. A mutual friend of ours, Dante, walked over to the guy and literally sat on him while he called 911. I watched as this guy spit out a couple of teeth before lying still. It didn't take long for the police to show up and my mom soon arrived as well. She told me that my uncle had a pipe break in the basement and he'd been fixing it all morning long. He'd honestly forgotten about his duty at the party. We later found out who the guy was. He was a registered SO who'd failed to register in our area. There was already a warrant out for his arrest. He decided to crash a party full of teens fresh out of high school and then attempted to hurt my friend. The guy had to stay in the hospital for a week, and then he was taken straight to jail. The guy later confessed after they found a bus ticket with his personal effects. He said he just wanted some action before skipping town. Cassidy, Sean, and myself are all still close. 
We look back on this less and less throughout the years. It brought us closer, but the scars are still very much there. The creepy man got 11 years in jail, and for his sake, whenever he comes out, he better stay far away from us. Three. Fourth of July Creepers by Sohelia H. It was the 4th of July in 2014. Everyone was so excited to see the fireworks on a breezy summer evening. Me and my family were packing for the night. We brought chairs, snacks, and other typical things you know you would bring on a 4th of July evening. It was around 8.30 p.m. when we arrived at the place where the fireworks were going to be displayed. They would start at 9 p.m., so it would be absolutely dark before they started. I set up my chair in a great spot where I could see the fireworks clearly. After 40 minutes of waiting, they began. They started 10 minutes late, and 10 minutes later, it was over. As we had our dogs with us, it wasn't really safe to be walking back with them with so many people leaving. So we kept them close and waited a few minutes for the crowd to clear up. We then packed up our chairs and snacks, then headed to the car. The streets were flooded with cars and people trying to leave, so it wasn't easy to get back home. My dad was not patient with all the traffic. When we entered a busy intersection, it happened. My dad went in front of a truck that was trying to leave. The driver honked the horn at our car, most likely because he was trying to go in front, trying to get ahead of us so he could be first. The truck was now behind our car, I looked back to see the driver of the car, and there were three men who looked to be teenagers. As we were driving down the busy streets, the truck still seemed to be driving behind us. We didn't really think much of it at the time. Now at this point, it was already 10.30 p.m., and the truck was driving into our neighborhood behind us, and as our neighbor has the same truck of the same color, my dad now thought he must be our neighbor. Maybe he was coming home from the same event. We finally drove down onto the street where our house was. I looked at the house next to ours, and the neighbor's truck was already there, yet the same truck was behind us. So clearly, this was not our neighbor. It was then that we knew we had been followed by someone who was apparently teed off. My mom told my dad to turn the car around because she did not want them to know where we lived. My dad drove out of the street and out of the neighborhood but the truck continued to pursue us. After driving for another five minutes, we stopped on the side of the road to see if they would pass our car, but they wouldn't. My dad decided he wanted to get out to see what they wanted, but my mom ultimately convinced him that that was a bad idea. They may not be sober, and they were probably armed. At this point, being a young kid, I was scared, confused, and crying, not knowing what was gonna happen. My dad drove to a gas station for gas and to see if they would still follow, and they did. They kept right behind us. My dad was concerned for my family's safety, so he decided to approach the three guys. I could hear from the distance these strangers calling my dad names and threatening his life, as well as mine and my mother's, though they were saying some very unpleasant and different things about what they'd do to us. I was bawling my eyes out, my dad went inside the gas station quickly, as he did not want to leave us alone for long, and fortunately, there were cops inside the store. The cops came out and approached the men from a distance. He began to investigate what was going on, but it turns out, these guys were indeed packing. I'm talking machetes and firearms. Along with that, they were very, very drunk. After a while, the cops told us we were free to go. After that, we never saw them again. If those cops weren't there, I'm not sure what would have happened. They followed us for so long. Were they waiting to see where we lived before they finally used all the weapons they had? Four, something is in the apartment by Carly. This takes place about two years ago some of which happened over the course of Christmas and Independence Day. I'm 20 years old, living along the East Coast. 
During my childhood, my mom and dad were constantly in and out of jail. My younger brother and I have lived with my saint of a grandmother since I was seven and he was five. My dad had been out for some time and finally found an okay apartment to live in. Nothing special, but it sufficed. My mother moved too, about two months later. My brother and I would visit whenever we could, which was pretty easy because our high school was a 25 minute walk or so from where they lived. Little did we all know, this would be the start of some bizarre events that none of us could explain. There are several instances, so if I'm all over the place, I do apologize. I remember when I first walked into the building. It's hard to explain the feeling you get as soon as you enter through that door. It was so cold and honestly very depressing, like something horrible happened there. It was always something I kind of shrugged off, chalked it up to my mind playing tricks on me. Now, my father was never the type of person to believe in the paranormal, and even I was sort of on the fence about it. I would try to rationalize these events to ease my mind in any way I could. In 2015, I had just gotten back from a concert. I had gone with my dad. I was beyond tired after the show, so I laid down and did my usual catching up on some YouTube stuff I missed. About an hour later, I finally decided to try sleeping. Because the apartment was so small, I would drag a mattress into the living room and crash there. Fancy living, I know. I had my head facing the door at the end of the hallway when I see what looked like a tall man over six feet in height. He stepped out from the side room directly into the center of the hallway as if he wanted me to see him. He swayed back and forth for a good 30 seconds, then turned and walked back into the side room. Everyone else was sleeping, so I just laid there, absolutely paralyzed with fear. I had no idea how to rationalize it. I was wide awake. I wasn't drinking or anything like that, 100% sober. I somehow managed to fall asleep, and I told my mom everything the next morning. What she began to tell me made my heart pound. She admitted that for the last several months, she would be laying there watching TV when she would hear low, guttural growls right next to her head, as if a wild animal was right next to her, angry. Then it began happening in the middle of the night. My mom is small and sweet looking, but she can be a tough woman. Yet she looked horrified as she told me this, I think she was low-key relieved that I experienced something myself because all of this was starting to make her feel crazy. It only started getting worse from there. Her and my father went to bed one night a few weeks later like usual. While my dad was getting ready for work, he noticed that my mother had a pretty bad black eye that wasn't there the night before. My mom was a light sleeper so she would have woken up if my dad had accidentally clocked her or something in the middle of the night. They tried dismissing it until my dad began waking up with long scratches all over his body. My mom was beyond freaked out, but again, my dad didn't believe in the paranormal and he tried to forget about it. Fast forward three months, we were all watching a movie and chilling like we usually do whenever my brother and I are over. Suddenly, my dad sits up and goes, Guys, look at my freaking shirt. When we looked over, it literally appeared like someone was tugging at it. And I don't mean lightly. It was being stretched and pulled seven inches from his body. But there was nothing holding his shirt. It looked like a magic trick or something from a movie. We originally thought he was messing with us somehow until he proved he had zero to do with it. Fourth of July comes around, and the four of us left the apartment to find fireworks. I had canceled plans with friends, so I was down for fireworks anyway. At that point, my older half-brother was renting the apartment just below ours, because the place had reasonable prices. My brother called my mom to see if we had left yet. When she told him we were out watching fireworks, he freaked out, telling us he thought someone was in our upstairs apartment. He had been hearing heavy walking and drawers being opened 
and slammed shut. My brother then ran upstairs to find whoever was in there, ready to do some damage knowing him. The layout of the building is important. If someone was upstairs, they would have walked right past my brother's door to get out of the building. He was by the door the whole time he heard it. He went up to find no one, just open drawers. I'm not gonna lie, I tried to avoid going over there anymore because I always felt like I was being watched. Around Christmas time of that year, a good friend of my mom and dad's named Dave passed away. My mother was given his ashes. This is relevant because as soon as his ashes were brought in, all the activity completely stopped. No growling, no dark apparitions, scratching or pulled out of drawers. I'm not religious or spiritual, but I truly think Dave warded off something possibly very evil. Maybe even Dave is protecting us. I'm just glad it's over. Five, Fourth of July Experience by Alicia D. It was the 4th of July and my parents were out of town, so I had a friend over. We were going to put a firework display on and then a campfire to just chill out around and spend some time together. But that didn't go too well for us. It was around 7 p.m. when Amy came over. She seemed kind of like she saw a ghost. She came inside and she said, uh, was that your grandma walking into your garden out there? Immediately, I was shocked, and I had to explain to her that my grandma had passed away before I was born. I'd never met her before. We went ahead and locked the doors, assuming that some strange elderly person had dementia and was walking around outside. Later on, we stopped thinking about it, then ordered some food and watched a movie. The food arrived around 9.30 p.m., it was extremely dark out by then. We decided now was as good a time as any for the fireworks, so we began to set them off and we watched and Snapchatted the majority of it. One of the fireworks went extremely wrong and ended up popping into my shed. The shed caught fire and Amy had to call the fire department. We tried to control it until then with an extinguisher, but because I lived with my garden facing a forest, we were panicking as it was getting bigger and bigger by the second. It was so close to the woods, we were afraid we were going to start a wildfire. As we watched in worry, I felt lips on my ear and a whisper, stay away. I think that's what it said. I jumped and freaked out. I shouted, what the heck, and turned around. Amy at this point was in the corner crying, saying I was just staring at the flames for the longest time. She said she had been shouting at me for about 15 minutes trying to snap me out of a trance. What was she talking about? I had just turned around when I heard the whispering. I asked her what she meant, and she repeated herself, explaining that I'd been standing and staring without blinking for 15 minutes, just watching the fire. The fire brigade turned up and put out the fire. They told us we need to be more careful next time. We certainly listened. We stayed inside for the rest of the night and Amy sat down telling me she saw the woman again. She was standing in the garden, and she was only there for as long as I was standing still in that trance. She said in all honesty, the woman did not appear to be alive. She was pale, and her eyes were almost solid white. She appeared to be saying something under her breath, as her lips were moving constantly. By the time I'd snapped out of it, the woman was gone. A while later, my mom had called us after the firefighters alerted her as to what happened. I told her everything that went down tonight, and after she had chilled out being angry at what we did, I asked her about the woman, and I asked her about grandma. She explained to me that we did not talk about grandma because she wasn't a good human being. She said that grandma in her 20s had taken a man's life instead of serving time the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence, only for her to later admit that she did it to her close friends and relatives. I don't know if Amy was telling the truth. She always has before, and she's never been a paranormal believer like that. So for her to suddenly report all this strange activity 
It has me worried. Six, Leave Me Alone by Taraki. This is my story of the thing that stalked me through the woods on July 4th of last year. Every year for Independence Day, my father and I go camping. During that time, my mother goes and stays with her aunt and they have a girls' night. Last year, the creepiest thing happened. As we were setting up the tent in our campsite, I started to hear shifting in the forest behind me. As it continued and grew louder, I no longer thought it was just a small animal. From the sound of it, it was either a person or something just as large. Freaked out, I ran over to my dad, led him to where the noises were coming from, but of course, things had gone silent. The next day, I had gone down a trail early in the morning to get some exercise while dad overslept. While walking down the path, to my horror, the same loud and heavy rustling sound came directly from my left. This time it was accompanied by deep and grating laughter. I knew then that someone was messing with me, and from the sound of it, they were much, much older than me. The last thing an adult should be doing is stalking a 14-year-old girl through the woods. I started running back, and the rustling next to me only followed, matching my speed with ease. When I did make it back, I woke up my father, yet once more the stalker and the noises were gone. My groggy father got started with the day, while I wondered how early we could leave. Later that night, as we were packing up to go home after doing a bit of fishing, I was in the back of the truck making sure the large tent bag was strapped into place as my dad's truck didn't have a tailgate. I began to hear that rustling sound again. I looked up and over to the woods nearby where the noise was coming from. At this point, it was both annoying and creepy. But when I looked over, I screamed. After fully expecting to never see what it was, I actually saw it, a face leaning out from the woods. And unfortunately, and I kid you not here, it wasn't exactly a man's face. It had the build of a man's face, sure, but it was covered in hair and its lower jaw hung down low as it breathed through its mouth. It seemed to be smiling at me. As soon as it noticed that I saw it, it turned and walked away. My dad came up to me wondering what the screaming was about, but I stayed quiet and shook my head. We left soon after that, and I haven't been back yet, but July 4th is coming up soon this year, and I'm very nervous about going back. Seven, Independence Day Sleepover by Moon. My friend, let's call her Sam, had invited me over to her house for the 4th of July for a sleepover. She was a year younger than me, and she had a younger sister and brother. I got there in the afternoon, and we started off with some goofing around with her siblings. As the night went on, her mom pulled up a movie for us to watch just before the fireworks began. We had gotten bored, and the four of us decided on a game of hide and seek in the dark. She had walkie-talkies, so all of us got one in case one of us got hurt or found someone and needed backup. Sam and I were waiting in a bush, trying to scare each other, talking about what monsters might come up and grab us. We had to hush our giggling as her little brother came closer to our hiding spot. He was just about to find us when I decided to spring up and run for the shadows. I have pretty long legs, so it was easy to lose him. From my perch, I saw Sam running for the back of the house. With the flash of nearby fireworks, I could see them perfectly. I had turned off my phone to prevent them from seeing it light up. I was lying in another bush for a while. No one had found me or come close for a long time. I decided to call up Sam on one of the walkie-talkies. We teased each other, giving hints about our locations, but never fully telling where we were. We watched as the two younger kids went inside to do something, 
basically giving up on finding us. Sam was laughing about it, but over the walkie-talkie, I heard another sound, like footsteps and twigs snapping. It couldn't have been the kids because everyone else was inside now, save for those that were shooting off the fireworks. I started to feel like something wasn't quite right. I asked her on the walkie-talkie, Sam, is everything okay over there? There was a long pause, which made me want to get up and find her right away. But I settled in as her voice made it back through. Actually, I'm not sure. I think... And then before she could finish, the talkie went fuzzy, and I started to panic. I pressed the button after a while, thinking it was a prank. That was until I heard Sam screaming her lungs out from the backyard. I ran behind the house, looking for her, following the screaming sounds, and luckily the fireworks were still lighting my way. When I got there, I saw a large figure running back into the forest. I thought maybe it was her, but she wasn't answering my calls. A moment or two later, I heard her crying from a circle of trees nearby. I ran right over and hugged her tightly. She was sputtering things out, saying something I couldn't understand, but as I held on to her, I saw before us a pair of yellow eyes. I put my finger to my lips telling her to hush and to stay still, but this made her panic more. I felt her squeezing my hand so tightly it hurt. I stared back into the yellow eyes of the thing, wondering what it was. From what I could make out, it had a large body and pointed ears, and there was a low snarling coming from it, meaning it was probably baring its teeth at me. Out of nowhere, the kids ran out of the house slamming the door behind them, causing the creature's head to snap up at the sound. It was then that I saw that it looked like a wolf, but much larger and bulkier, and there was something about its eyes when I saw the details of them. They looked like a person's eye. The slits were side to side instead of diagonal, and there was a lot of white to it, like a person's eye. After I snapped myself out of it, I quickly ran with Sam back to the house. We had made up an excuse that she had hurt her ankle to make it more believable as to her crying and me carrying her. And that night, we went to bed early and neither of us could sleep. I sat up and asked her what she saw and what she told me shocked her. She said that when we were talking, she heard a twig snap from behind her and she quickly assumed it was me sneaking up on her. She smiled, picked up a pine cone, and threw it at the noise, but it wasn't me after all. In response, a growl erupted from the forest. A popping firework went off, giving her a quick view of the creature. She said its ears were pointed, and its body was toned. There was a long string of drool hanging from its mouth. She said after that, she ran, tried to hide, and then ultimately screamed for my help. We're not sure what we saw that night. Some very big stray dogs, maybe. Maybe even coyotes or wolves. But none of it really matches the size or description of what we saw, and I hope it was the only time we'll meet them. Eight, Fourth of July Hike by James H. I was 13 when this happened. It was the 4th of July of 2013, and I was going for a hike. I was heading over to my uncle's place because he has a little more than 25,000 acres on his land. He had found one of my dad's old trails and said we should go over to it and see where it leads to. When I got there, we got on his old Kubota and it took us 30 to 45 minutes to drive out there. When we got to the trail, something just didn't feel right. We got started on the hike. We saw a lot of rabbits and birds, a few deer even, and after about an hour into the hike, the feeling of dread went away. But then I noticed that it was getting eerily quiet until my uncle said something. What the? He then pulled out his pistol and pointed it in the other direction. I looked to see what he was aiming at, and I was mortified. All I could see from that distance, or my angle, was fur in a stack that was six or seven feet tall, 
and it appeared to be breathing and looking at my uncle. My uncle said to it, that better be a costume. If it is, take it off right now, or I'm going to put one through your head. In response, before my uncle even finished his demand, the creature shrieked so loud we had to cover our ears, and then it charged at my uncle. I was overweight and couldn't go very fast, but you would think I was a track star at the way I ran that day. My uncle was behind me. We were gunning it back to the Kubota. I heard about five shots behind me, and then it went quiet. I made it back to the Kubota and waited in silent tears, hoping that the next thing that came from that tree line was my uncle. Something burst forth, and I nearly screamed, but it was him, and he was holding his arm as a red liquid poured out of it. He was badly hurt. I helped my uncle up, and we hightailed it out of there. We never saw anything like that again, and my uncle is fine. But ever since, he's extremely wary of that part of his land and seems to stay away from it. I can't say I blame him, though. Nine, Independence Day Campout by JGD. It was July 3rd of 2016, the Sunday before Independence Day, and me, two of my friends, David and Raymond, were in the forest of Grayling, Michigan, hoping to spend our 4th of July in the wilderness. Dave is the oldest of us at 18. Ray and I are 16. I stand six foot five and weigh nearly 300 pounds, and I look a lot older than I am. We're all friends from school, and we can usually lie or bullcrap our way out of problems, but not this time. We enjoy playing airsoft, and we brought our equipment up there to mess around with. We had lied to our parents and said we were crashing at a friend's place when we had actually ran up north to Grayling. We arrived after four hours on the road in Dave's beat-up old 73 Chevy 4x4, one of his dad's hand-me-downs. We set up our tents in the backwoods by a pond, a place me and my dad call the Crap Hole, due to its pungent aroma and general appearance. We ended up just screwing around nearby until the sun went down. Then we started a campfire, threw a few big logs in it and ate some MREs we had brought. We started the truck and started blasting the radio, specifically Dwight Yoakam, until midnight. And that's when we started an airsoft game. We got dressed up in our gear and headed in three different directions. After a few minutes of hiking away from one another, we got on our walkie-talkies and agreed it was go time. Just to set the scene, I'm wearing a GPS gas mask and wearing black cargo pants and a black t-shirt, a bandolier made of duct tape running around the forest, talking to myself in barely coherent Russian, probably just nonsense I'd learned from a combination of Rosetta Stone and Call of Duty games. After maybe 15 minutes, I ran up on our campsite and found Dave and Ray standing there, What's wrong? I thought we were playing, I asked. Then Ray answers. Dude, somebody went through our stuff. Check your bag. See if anything's missing. I did. My cell phone, video camera, and all my money was gone. I was mad. I had at least $2,000 worth of stuff, stolen by some backwoods redneck. They'd even smashed in one of the windows on Dave's truck, sending him into a flurry of curses. We figured that whoever stole and smashed our stuff was gone now, but we decided to go ahead and get out of there. We were packing up our last tent when we heard some rustling in the brush about 20 feet away from us, a few twigs snapping. We ripped the tent stakes right out of the ground and threw them in the truck bed, then dumped out a bucket of water onto the fire, just as we heard someone scream, You're not getting away followed by some very choice words. We hauled tail out of there. Dave and Ray had hopped into the cab while I was in the bed. As we sped off, he just kept shouting a bunch of insensitive slurs. We drove into town and stayed at a motel. None of us slept that night. It was hard to sleep because we heard someone outside at the truck. We couldn't make out what they were saying from our motel room, but they sounded angry 
I think it was the man. He had followed us to the motel. Eventually, it was morning, and the angry man sounded like he was gone. We checked outside and saw nothing unusual. We left the motel room and went to the truck, and it had been keyed. A bunch of terrible slurs and curses had been keyed into the truck. The man had also taken the liberty of smashing in the window and returning my camera and Ray's phone. Watch this had been sharpied on the side. Now, my expensive camera had a low light visibility mode, just black and white night vision. The sicko had recorded himself, touching himself, as he watched us from a tree, hurriedly racing off from our campsite. He had dropped the camera to run at us as we were leaving. He goes back and picks it up. It cuts to black for a moment, then it comes back on. He's standing just outside of our motel, having spotted our truck and muttering more obscenities. He scratched up the truck with a screwdriver while laughing his backwoods butt off. Then he walked up to a motel room door, our door, and opened it because apparently the door hadn't locked right. But luckily for us, he just laughed, then ran off. Of course, after leaving the stuff in our truck and leaving us a very rude and unwelcome goodbye. After seeing all that, and because we had lied about where we were and I felt more in trouble and guilty than angry, I ended up burning that camera to hide all evidence that we were there. I know better now but I didn't back then. When we arrived back home, we admitted nothing. We said that we had been staying at each other's houses. As for the window and the missing electronics, we said the truck had been broken into and things were stolen. We were living in midtown Detroit, so the lie was easily believed. Be careful when you travel into the middle of the woods. Don't lie to your parents about where you're going. Even if you did lie, and you end up in this kind of situation. Don't be afraid to come clean to your parents, because now that psycho is still out there. Who knows what he'll do if more kids enter his woods. 10. Nightmare in Elkhorn by Anonymous2196 Many people ask themselves if the creatures of myth and legends do exist. Most would say of course they don't, but let me be the first to tell you that things do go bump in the night. The story takes place three years ago in the early part of July. I went with my girlfriend up to Elkhorn. We went up there pretty often. We made pretty regular trips to Bray Road, and that day didn't seem any different at first. Upon arrival, it was the same as any other night. We drove through the road, examining anything suspicious, and as always, we found nothing. You see, we've heard of the Bray Road Beast and the Michigan Dog Man, and this is what we wanted to see. My girlfriend was a big believer in those things, believed that werewolves were real, but I sat there for a good 10 minutes driving around when we didn't see anything, thinking to myself how stupid it was to even think that werewolves exist. It was just a moment later that would change my life and mind forever. I was staring across the cornfields in the moonlight. I saw a figure rise and break through the surface of the corn. It had the face of a wolf. And as I stared at it, I saw that its body was more like a man. Even after all these years, I still remember the vision of it so clearly. It was muscular and scrawny at the same time, meaning the meat it had on its body was very toned and tense, as if it spent most of the time on the move. Its most prominent feature, though, were those yellow eyes. They were cold and intimidating, and the only way I knew to react when I saw it was to scream, what in the world is that? My girlfriend jumped in her seat and looked over towards me, but she wasn't the only one whose attention I got, because the thing I was staring at turned its yellow eyes towards me, and it began running on two powerful, long legs. I stepped on the gas, 
but the creature kept pace with our vehicle for the longest time, making me think we were doomed. But we finally reached town. I didn't sleep that night. I was too afraid to, even though the doors and windows were very much locked tight. If I had to say anything, if you find yourself in Michigan or near Elkhorn, be on the lookout for the dog man, because he will make a believer out of you. Thank you for tuning in to Unexplained Encounters. If you're not already, follow and listen to Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Leave us a rating while you're at it. Get some cool creepy merch at eeriecast.store. Check out my other show where I narrate scary work stories. It's called Tales from the Break Room. For more terrifyingly entertaining shows from EerieCast, go to eeriecast.com. And if you want to listen to Unexplained Encounters and all the other EerieCast shows without pesky ads, sign up for EerieCast Plus at eeriecast.com plus. You'll also get exclusive access to horror audiobooks only available to EerieCast Plus members. And you'll get 20% off our EerieCast.store merch through our members-only monthly discount code. Finally, if you have a scary story of the unexplained, send it to me at darkstories.org. I think that's about it. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world... It's a strange one.